Let's get started today. Good evening, everyone. My name is Bhuja Bhattacharya. I'm a physics professor here at uh, Lawrence Tech. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming here today. Let me welcome you here. This event is being live telecast on the YouTube uh, channel of Lawrence Tech, and I welcome everybody who's joining us remotely. Uh, joining us today here is Lawrence Technological University's Vice President for Academic Affairs and Provost, Dr. Richard Heist. I now invite Dr. Heist uh, to say a few words to the audience. Please. We bow to technology, but we're, we're kind of lucky because on the 8th, we're going to be part of what's I almost think of as sort of a magical experience. And now, of course, being the highly technologically focused institution that we are, there's no magic at all behind it. Sir Isaac Newton had it figured out many hundreds of years ago, and it works like a charm. In fact, it's remarkable, but there's still a little bit of magic to it. And that magic has persisted for, for actually quite a long time, thousands of years. As a matter of fact, some of you may remember um, there was a book written in, in 1889 by Mark Twain called A Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court. And there was a subsequent movie, 1949, Bing Crosby, Rhonda Fleming, William Bendix, or Cedric Hardwick, these players. And the basic uh, thrust of the story is that Bing Crosby, or actually Hugh Morgan was the, the main character, was a, a, a machinist working in one of the gun factories up in East Hartford, Connecticut. And he got into a struggle with some workers, and one of them beamed him over the head with a crowbar and knocked him out. Then the story picks up with our hero waking up, leaning against a tree in a lush forest, lots of green grass and everything, but there's this knight in shiny armor with his jousting spear prodding our hero, who's laying on the ground next to the tree, wondering what the heck's going on here. The, what eventually happens is they take him into Camelot and, and the Arthurian court, and he begins to realize he's in a really good position because the sorts of things that he does normally is, is really strange. It's this idea to, to a, 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 an, an earlier civilization, later technology can seem like magic. And so Bing Crosby takes a, one of those matches itself and he flicks it with his thumb and lights and everybody says, ooh, you know, really a scary thing. And so he, he does a lot and he actually ends up alienating Merlin, who is a very powerful magician in the court, uh, loving power and access he had to, to uh, King Arthur. And that bends him out of shape and eventually they uh, find a way to put, uh, they want to put you, Morgan, to death and they're gonna burn him at the stake. And so there's our hero tied to the stake. And wouldn't you know it, here's this machinist from East Hartford in, in 1912 is when this takes place. Remembers that on June 21st, 528, there was a solar eclipse, a total, by the way, it was right over England. Now I'm, I'm wondering, did he really know that? But anyway, if you're a writer, you have lots of license. So he threatens to have, the sun destroyed and of course the eclipse happens and blows everybody away and he gets put down and, and then the story continues. It's actually a, a fun book to read. But that's not the only one. In, in 1885, there was another English, there was an English author, a guy named H. Ryder Haggard. If you haven't read any of these books, they're great adventure books. One of them is called King Solomon's Mind. And the main character in there is an Alan Quatermain who is an adventurer and he has a group of uh, colleagues English colleagues looking for the legendary King Solomon's mind. This is King Solomon of biblical history, right? And so they're looking, so they, but they have the weapons and, and technology that pretty much protects them from the local native tribes. And so they're in this one tri the, the one village and, and they discover that they, the, 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 the natives had just had, they were at war with another village. They captured a number of young, uh, young women and they were going to put them to death. And of course, Alan Quatermain couldn't have this. And he too remembers that there's going to be a total solar eclipse. And sure enough, he threatens and argues. And finally, they're ready to uh, sacrifice these young women. And Quatermain puts his hand up and 
that's Stuart Granger, actually, in case you're really wondering. But anyway, and here comes the solar eclipse and wows them and eventually frees the girls. It, it doesn't only happen in literature. You know, back in, in 1505, when Columbus was making one of his many trips to the New World, he landed in Jamaica with a number of his, his um, sailors. And, and you may remember, they weren't really nice people with respect to how they treated the natives. And so there was a, a lot of tension built up and it got to a point that there was really looking like there was gonna be some serious trouble. And of course, Columbus remembers or he has his almanac that says, ah, there's a lunar eclipse that we're gonna have. And sure enough, you know, it's, it's the same story repeating itself again. And they managed to get, to get out of trouble because of these magical moments that we're going to experience uh, together on the 8th. It really is fun. The last one I saw, I was in Florida we used, I was mentioning to, to uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, we used the, the compact discs, you know, the, the silver kind of, it, it's a great way to view uh, a, an, an event like this. It works really well because it is dangerous. So you got to be careful what you're doing. But anyway, so I'm going to stop and, and, and with a little bit of, again, thanking uh, Sir Isaac Newton for all that he's been able to do and let us do these wonderful things that Professor Schneider is going to talk to us about uh, in a little while. So I'll turn to podium back to uh, Dr. Bhattacharya, and, and thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, Dr. Heist, for that uh, very enticing uh, introduction. That's a wonderful story. <laughs> Good to hear. Um, now, before I introduce today's speaker, I want to really, it's my job to thank a bunch of people who helped us set this up, and, you know, if you, if you, uh, know what this is about. It's about the eclipse that's going to happen on, uh, on uh, April 8th. Um, and you can see a picture over there, right, so of what it's going to kind of look like um, with, with, the speak with today's speaker over there who's just waiting for that photo op and everybody else is actually, you know, taking advantage of the moment. Um, so, yeah. So I want to thank uh, the folks that helped us. Yellow Flag uh, really, you know, helped us with the design. Our AV support team is here. They're helping us put this on YouTube. Um, the Department of Natural Sciences Chair's Office and uh, um, uh, the Dean of College of Arts and Sciences helped us um, a lot, so thank you. And of course, thank you to my physics colleagues who know who you are and, and the person who actually took this picture, you know who you are, so thank you for that. Now, it gives me immense pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Scott Schneider. Many of you here are his students. Uh, you probably know that uh, around uh, town we call him uh, Dr. Scott. He's an associate professor of physics. He grew up in Poughkeepsie, New York, earned his bachelor's degree in physics from Rochester Institute of Technology in Rochester, New York, and went on to earn his PhD in physics from the State University of New York at Albany. During his summer in graduate school, Dr. Scott worked at a deaf youth summer camp in the Adirondacks in upstate New York. From that experience, he made connections that brought him to Michigan. We are glad he came to Michigan. A chance experience in Star Trail, Star Trail photography led him to photography as a hobby, mostly landscape nature photography. He started with film cameras, but is now fully digital. He better be digital now in this age. Dr. Scott is particularly interested in patterns in nature and photogra photographing textures in the natural world. Now, Dr. Scott is our go-to person for all things astronomy. While physics and astronomy are his ultimate passions, um, LTU athletics comes close. And while he's taking pictures of nature, we take pictures of him. The one on the left, by the way, that's just a low-key game day costume, if you believe it or not. Right? Now, Dr. Scott's true legacy is as the ultimate supporter of students. He's not just about cheering the loudest for all of the teams. He reads lines with the Society of Dramatic Arts, or SODA, mentors student, student groups ranging from physics, sororities, and the campus's first LGBT plus group. For his dedication to our athletics team, Dr. Scott has earned the title of Blue Devil Superfan. In 2023, he was awarded the Laura Affer Blue Devils Legacy Award and inducted into the LTU Athletics Hall of Fame. Yep. Now, let me just uh, 
uh, digress for a bit. Uh, this is really the real intro introduction I to. Didn't like this. You wrote this, so. <laughs> Does, do any of you need to um, schedule a special event? So I have a personal story to tell about scheduling events. I joined Lawrence Tech in the fall of 2017. August 21st, 2017, maybe some of you remember it, this was the first day of our fall classes in 2017. And my first day as a professor, a day I very well remember. I wasn't expecting the day to be anything unusual. Um, but when I got to campus that day, there were hundreds of people waiting on the LTU quad. Dr. Scott was at the center of all the commotion, um, giving students, faculty, staff, and others from outside LTU a view of a celestial event. We like to joke that Scott, uh, that Scott arranged a solar eclipse to welcome me to campus. But of course, scheduling time with the sun and the moon it is quite difficult, right? I mean, after all, they're on a tight schedule. So that eclipse was only uh, about 80% close to totality. Well, guess what? Dr. Scott has worked really hard for the past few years, and almost seven years later, our campus will see a solar eclipse that is almost 99% close to totality. So I couldn't think of a better person to tell us about eclipses, what comes before and after. So without fur further ado, Dr. Scott Schneider, everybody. So there are some on campus that haven't seen the lower half of my face in about four years. Um, so I am a very grateful kidney recipient. And so I have had a kidney transplant that puts me in an immune compromised situation. So that's why the mask is on. So, but thank you, yes. So I wanna take a moment to thank Dr. Bujo because um, he either graciously or foolishly, depending on how you look at it, chose to do all the coordination for this event here, for, for also for the event uh, on the 8th, where we're gonna have telescopes in the quad. So any of the machinations behind the scenes of scheduling this and checking to see if those things are available and everything, he took that on so I was able to focus on the talk and then able to focus on getting the telescopes ready. So I do really appreciate that and all my colleagues will be out there. We're gonna have some of our students out there um, and so it's a whole group effort, it takes a, village, right, to run a solar eclipse. So um, this is the nice graphics from our yellow flag. It's a little bit artistic license going on there. It, it seems like the sun's about to burn up the moon. Um, I do like this feature in the middle here where you see some of the moon, which if the sun's behind the moon, how are we seeing the front? That actually be earth shine. Some of the earth is going to have light on it. It's going to reflect back up. So you would see some of it. You might see some over here too, but this looks very dramatic. So I like that. Okay, so this is, the, we've heard a little bit about before, eclipses before, I'll show you some more there. Eclipses after, I go by Dr. Scott on campus, there's my contact information, I'll have that slide at the end too. Um, I chose sort of a path through the various, a path through the various eclipses um, to try and give you some ideas uh, of what's going on, why they work the way they do, and um, show you some of the examples. And we've got some simulations we can run too. So you might have noticed, I think you signed up for the 24 hour marathon, right? I, hopefully everybody's good for that. Okay, the bathroom's down the hall in the middle. So, okay. So what's gonna happen on the eighth? Okay, thanks everybody, we'll see you. Oh, maybe you want a little bit more information. Okay, so this is more local for the campus here. So we have a total, quotes, solar in bold yellow eclipse. Total means, well, maybe it's not quite total or maybe it's not total all the time. And then solar means there might be some other kind of eclipse, that'd be a lunar eclipse. So for us, it's about just a little bit before two o'clock and just before 4.30. Our maximum, which only we're gonna get 99%, we're sitting at about 3.14. So we wanna remember those numbers. There's a bunch of numbers you're gonna have to remember because the quiz at the end is super long, okay. We're gonna have telescopes out there. We're gonna have some projection telescopes so you could actually take a selfie with the eclipse next to you or look through the eyepiece and it's filtered. We're gonna have solar glasses. We don't have an, a billion solar glasses, but we've got, should be plenty to go around. We've got some simple other techniques, pinhole camera sort of techniques to show. And so we'll start a little after 1.30, that's before the eclipse, but we'll run right through the eclipse. Okay, so maps, 
here's the campus map, so those are th that are here. Oh, I meant to say, I welcome the people that are online, the TV land, the people are out there. I've got people across the country that are watching. I've got both ends of Canada, I think, are watching. And I want to shout out specifically to Poughkeepsie, New York, which, whoops, sorry, sorry, audio people, um, which Dr. Bujo referenced. Um, I, there's some lady there that I know, and that's mom. Hi, mom. Okay, so you're supposed to, oh, there, okay. They said, oh, mom, okay. So uh, here's the campus map. So you, those of you here in the auditorium, you found this place. And so you're sitting over here in S100 right now. Those are the parking lots. You probably use those. The X in the middle, X marks the spot. That's where we're going to set up our telescopes. The parking lots there are probably the best place, but the, four, the Monday is a school day. So parking is going to be a little challenging. But I would recommend there because I think that's the best path, best path to get into where the eclipses are going to be, or the telescopes are going to be. We're going to set up an info table. There's a rock out there that I don't know in April if it's smoking or not, but it might be misting and smoking and stuff. But somewhere in there, there's like a little patio thing. We'll probably set up an info table there to feed down into where the telescopes will be. Okay, so eye safety. The provost mentioned eye safety is very important. I'm not sure that's the exact quote from the Christmas Story movie, but it, it works for our purposes here. So you're looking for a particular standard on the sunglasses. So if you get sunglasses outside, ours all meet these standards. Now, I was looking at my sunglasses from the last eclipse, and first of all, they're all sort of bent up, and they've been in my bag for a while, and I'm not going to use those because they're all bent up, and they're probably good. I mean, I get a very, very faint amount of light coming out of that really bright light over there. But I'm not going to use them because it's not, it's not worth it. Look at the bottom. It's why am I going to risk it? I'm going to use the new, brand new ones. But I looked at this and said, oh, wait a minute. These don't have the codes. Oh, wait, there's more codes. So if you've got those codes or you've got that code, newer glasses are going to have this code. Some of the glasses would, might still have those other codes. You want a reputable supplier. That's the key. So I like Rainbow Symphony. That's a place to get them. Um, American Paper Optics is another one. And this link right there, that would tell you where to get the good ones. That's a reputable set of dealers. Even Amazon would set, resell from some of these. I know American Paper Optics is up there in Canada, actually. The American Paper Optics is going doing business as something else up there. So, But we're going to have reputable glasses out to give out. We're also going to do some pinhole projection stuff. We've got filtered telescopes. We've got telescopes that will project, and that's going to put it onto a, a viewing sort of size like this. And then you could actually take it. I know all the young kids in the audience, they want their selfies. So you could have a selfie with the eclipse as opposed to looking through the eyepiece. You want to look through and get a slightly clearer view. Um, but we're going to have four sets of telescopes, two of each. Okay. We have cereal box pinhole cameras. So some nice, nice simple way with a cereal box. Long tube, cardboard tubes will make a nice sort of magnified image. Pringles cans, I'm using those for the telescopes to be able to spot where the sun is easily because it's you can't look through the scope to see without the filter, and it's hard to find the sun until you're locked right on it. So I don't want to get into copyright infringement. That's actually a scientifically calibrated sun alignment device. That's what I'm using there. So, But glasses are cheap, relatively. Don't risk your eyes. OK, so part two, because it's important. So we've got this weird magnitude system when we talk about how bright stuff is in the sky. And this came from the ancient Greeks. We stuck with it. So the sun is super bright because it's so close to us, negative 27. So negative is bright, but then positive is dim. That seems weird. Let's do it this way. 400,000 times, that's how much the sun is brighter than the full moon. 400,000 times. Now, here we're going to get about 1% of the sun that's still 4,000 times brighter than the full moon. We can easily damage eyes. So you can't look, if you're not in totality, you can't look at the sun without some sort of filter or some sort of projection. So everybody all together, don't look directly at the sun. Don't look directly at the sun. OK. So we're going to project the image. We're going to filter the image through the telescopes, filter telescopes and so forth. OK. So here's the um, timeanddate.com is a great place to find. You look for their eclipse area, eclipse 2024. They were set up for 2017, and now they're 2024. And so that's going to show the path. The edge of the path is down there. Toledo's in the totality. And you can see little slivers of, if I put, oh, you know what? I have a laser pointer here. Where did I put the laser pointer? Nothing like prepping for a talk, right? I know I had. That'll come back. Okay. 
here's my laser pointer. Point okay, there. thank you. Okay, so if we look, there we go. If we look, we get little tiny, oh, so uh, anti-rejection drugs, uh, that gives me a little bit of a jitter. I've had a plenty amount of caffeine today, but some of it is just the jitters from, so hopefully you'll follow the bouncing dot. Um, so you can see more of a sliver of the sun in Brighton. If you come down here, you almost don't see the slivers. So I'll show you another map that shows that more clearly. But these are the circumstances for us. Here's our 158. Here's our 314. Here's our 427, 428 or so. Um, so the duration is a good two and a half hours for the whole, you know, from very start to very end sort of thing. But these are great links. And I will try and get these links out on a page. I've got a, a link at the end. That would be the master link for some of these others. So if you can get into totality, wait, at the top there, 99% is not 100%. So if you see this talked about online, you're going to see people saying, you've got to go to totality. You have to go. Well, no, not everybody can go, right? Not everybody can get off work to go. You might be able to get off work to get in the middle of it, but you can't drive to totality necessarily, or you're way far away from where totality is. So you go with what you can do. If you can get to totality, I highly recommend it. Go to Toledo. I mean, go to Cleveland. Hello, Cleveland. But if you can't, Come here. We're going to go 99%. That's going to be pretty amazing. But 99% is not 100. What happens if you can get into totality? Well, it gets really much darker in totality. We're going to, I don't know how dark it's going to get for us. It's going to get dark, but not super dark. But birds and animals are going to be a little confused. All of a sudden, we've taken out most of the sun, especially in totality. If we've taken out the sun, they're going to be looking at their wristwatch. I mean, I'm, for the purpose of the argument, they have wristwatches. And they're going, honey... What time do you have? Like, what the, what's going on with that? Temperature's going to drop. You take away the sun, a cloud goes over, the temperature drops. You take away the sun with a moon, the, cloud, the temperature's going to drop. Shadows get weird. There's these wiggling sort of shadow bands just before totality and just after. I don't think we'll see them at 99 because we still have too much sun. We can't look without glasses. But depending on where you are, if you can see the horizon, you'd see the horizon lit up and you're in a shadow. That's got to be pretty cool. If you get a chance to go to totality and people watching, you should spend some of the time, if you have technology, you want to take pictures, video, telescopes, whatever, some of the totality doing that, and then put that technology away and just soak it in, enjoy. Because I've read so many stories of regret that, oh, I spent the whole totality trying to get the picture. Okay, you go halfway through totality, and then you just start looking around because it's pretty amazing. We can see more stars fainter planets and stuff. We're going to see some great stuff with, with even 99%. And the key is you can take off your glasses. You can look directly at the sun only during totality. We can't, right? Don't look directly at the sun. That, didn't, that, that wasn't very enthusiastic. Here's basically what we're going to see with our campus. So if you go out the doors here and look to your left, that's basically looking out to that sea. And Right around this time is when we took that other picture you saw of all the physicists and me just staring at the camera like an idiot. Okay, so the sun is setting. It's 2 to 4.30 in the afternoon, so the sun's setting over to the west. So both of those things, the sun and the moon, are both setting to the west. But the moon's sort of moving relative to the sun the other way. So notice the moon is to the right of the sun, initially up here, up high, so whoops, I got a pointer, up here. And then down here, now the moon's to the left of the sun. So the moon is crossing in front. There's that because the moon's orbiting around us. We'll see this more with other, some other slides. Got some orange dots there somewhere there. So right at totality, there's something about those orange dots. We'll see that in a second. Now the scopes are going to flip the image. So when I say the moon's going to cut into the sun from the right side as we look at it here, it's going to be from the left side in the scopes. I'll have a sign on the scope because that always throws me. Wait, what's the moon? Oh, right, it's flipped, it's flipped. Okay, so that's what we'll see basically at the campus. It's basically that part looking out over that part of the, of the campus there. That's our technology building. So I want to show you how this works. So give you a simulation. So I'm a world-class crocheter. And so I've got the sun and I've got the moon. And so the moon's going to come over and cover up. Is this, is this working in the back row? This, okay. <laughs> now, now that I think about it, though, I've got this giant screen. Why don't I... Do something there. Okay, so I'm going to do that instead. So there's the sun, there's the moon that comes over, and okay, I can do better than that. 
So we have software that we can use that would simulate a planetarium, right? This would let you see what's up in the sky, where the planets are, and then animate it. We can run it in time and so forth. And so 99% is not 100. It's going to get dark, and I'm not sure I'm interested to see how dark it gets. But we'll see planets because the planets are going to be bright enough. We've got Jupiter up there. We've got Venus. Those are those two orange dots in the previous slide. Now, if you look carefully, we've got down here, I seem to have a sketchy on button there. That's Saturn and Mars down there. So Mars is bright enough. It's close enough. Saturn's pretty far out. It's twice as far as Jupiter, but Jupiter's pretty bright because it's pretty big. Saturn, we should be able to see. That's going to be dark enough for us to see Saturn. Mercury's right in there. And Mercury will be a little bit challenging because we still have that sun in, fr in front of us. And so we can't look directly. We have to look filtered. And so we're not necessarily going to be able to see. Now, you could, if you cover up where the sun is, so you're not looking at the sun, you can have the glasses off and look to the side, right? We can see the planets by, okay, don't look at the sun, but look at the planets. Don't try and look for Mercury because that's too close to the sun. And I'm not going to swing the scopes over because we've got to take off the filter, swing the scope, to put the filter back on. It's, we're not going to be able to do that in time. But if you think, if you count, we've got Mercury somewhere there. Mercury, Venus, there's Venus, here's Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Those are all the five naked eye planets. Those are the ones you can see without telescopes. So remember that. And we've got the sun and the moon. So two, sun and the moon, five for the naked eye planets. That's one of the things you have to remember. We've got a comet up there. There's a comet that's getting closer to the sun, so it's getting brighter. I think we should have a dark enough sky to be able to see that comet visibly. I mean, that would be in a night sky, we'd be able to see that comet without the use of a telescope. OK, so let's go. There's this planetarium software. So it's called Stellarium. You can download a copy, run it on your machine, or there's a web version. This is perfect for this. I could just run it off the web. It'll show us a simulation of what's going on. We can watch the sun and the moon, how they move in the sky, how they move relative to each other. We'll see where the planets are. We'll see what's up there visible. And we can zoom in, too. There's some nice zooming features. So things to keep in mind. April 8th, maybe even now, is after the, summer, the, the spring equinox, right? So April 8th is definitely after. The equinox is where you get the equal day, equal time. So I've set up those, the software that's ready for us. Uh, I set it up before the equinox. I want to show you something about the equinox and then show you where the sun's rising and setting after the equinox. So it's a little mini astronomy lesson. Not totality here in Southfield, but we can jump down to Toledo. Might as well. We've got a software simulation. One to two minutes or so. I've got a niece out in Burlington, Vermont. So hi, Kelly. You better be watching. Um, so they're about three, she's about three and a half minutes. I think she's going to go for a hike and go for a mountain hike. And so she should be able to see that horizon lit up and so I'm jealous, three and a half. She better take video and pictures. Okay, let's switch over to that software. So I got that running over here. And I've got nothing showing. Let's do this. Let's come out of that. Oh, there they are. There's everything. There's everybody. Okay, so let's come over. What I've got is there's uh, 313, so March 13th. There's the time, so 7 o'clock in the morning. Now, where are we facing? There's south right there. And then over here, scroll it around. There's a, there's a fake landscape. This says Lawrence Tech down here, but that's not our landscape. So I missed where I'm pretty zoomed in. Oh, there's east over there. OK, so there's east, here's south. What I'm going to do is pull this out a bit. So I want to see both east and west. There, east and west, there's south. I could flat them out like that. Look how much power we have as astronomers. I mean, not that it goes to my head or anything, but um, so I'm just warping the earth here, if you don't mind. OK, so there's east and west. Here's 7 o'clock in the morning on the 13th. Now, 313 is Donald Duck's license plate number. If you look at the, OK, I hate when that happens. So let's try this. Does that take care of it? Good. Uh, Donald Duck's license plate number in the cartoon, in the, in the comics, is 313. Okay. So I picked that date there. So now, let's find where sunrise is. There's sunrise. Oh, that's Venus. Where's sunrise? There's sunrise. OK, so I need, it's a bright, there's east, there's west. OK, so if I look at where sunrise is, we're scrolling our seconds forward. I'm going to jump to this. 
minutes. Oh, there's the sun. Here's the sun over here, way south of east, right? We're before the equinox. Now, let's watch. If we go to sunrise, oh, well, that isn't the sun. The sun isn't up yet. There's the sun. Okay, the sun just rose there. So, so I see the sky get light. Okay, so right about there is sunrise, right? But it's sitting south of east. If we run it to the other side, it's going to run south of west. And it's going to set south of west. Well, this is sort of winter. We're end of winter, low sun, right? It's going to be a high sun in the summer, so the sun's moving up as it rises and sets. So this is a little added astronomy lesson for you. So come back to sunrise. I've got to remember to talk into the mic, right? The audio people back there going, I wish you would just talk into the microphone. So there's the sun right at sunrise. I'm going to go forward in days. I'm just going to jump days. So the 19th was the equinox. Now look, the sun's already up in the sky. Why is that? Oh, it rose earlier, right? I'd back up time or get to the sunrise. If I back up the time, ooh, right on east. And if I've got, oh, you know what? Oh, yeah, I'm going to learn stack. Okay, so there's the 19th. Here's 7.37 in the morning. Let's jump forward in hours. Ooh, sets west. 1937, which would be 737 at night. Hey, 12 hours day, 12 hours night. Okay, but we're not in the equinox. We're now heading into, we're in spring, we're heading into summer. So let's go forward to tonight. Here's the 28th. Sun's way up, right? It's already been up and it rose earlier. And then run it through the day. Now, the day we had today, let's hope for that on the 8th. That was fine. I would like that. I'll pay a dollar for that. Okay, and that sets north of west. It rose north of east, sets north of west. Okay, this is not the day we care about. We care about the 8th. So let's go back and see the 8th. Here's the eclipse day. Okay, so I'm going to run through. Let's just run through and watch the eclipse as it goes, as the sun rises and then sets. Ready? So remember what our timings were? This was like 2 in the afternoon to 4.30. So we're at 9.30. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to round this up. Let's get this up to 10 o'clock. And then get this down to zero. We'll just go on the hour. Okay, so there's 10 o'clock in the morning. So boom, 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 boom. Do you see the eclipse? What, what happened? We went right past it. It's the 8th, right? August, that's April 8th. Hmm. Here's 2 o'clock, it should be starting, right? 1,400 hours, 2 o'clock. 315 should be the minimum or the maximum. What's going on? Oh, we gotta, we gotta zoom our time a little bit better. So if I start at 2 o'clock, here's 2. Let's go by minutes. Okay, that's 2.30. That's 3 o'clock. Oh, oh, there we go. There we go. What's this? 3.14. Ta-da! Now, I hope it's that dark. I don't know if it's going to be that dark. But look in the sky. There's Saturn, there's Venus, there's Jupiter. If I zoom in over here, we'd get the comets up there. Way up here is the Pleiades. If anybody's got a Subaru, that's the front symbol for a Subaru. So the Pleiades we might be able to see. It's far enough away from where that, quote, bright sun, the 1% sun is. But there's all our planets in a row. So how many naked eye planets? Five. How many other things? Two, sun and the moon. Okay, keep rem remember that. Now, this is okay to see the eclipse like this. It'd be better to zoom in a little bit, right? I'm going to back out the hours for a second because what I'm going to do is we have the power to just zoom in. There's the sun. Now, the moon's somewhere over to the right there, somewhere over in here. Okay, there's the sun. If I start advancing, I'm at 9 in the morning. Where's my mouse? So I'm going to advance, but if I, let me just do a minute. Let's test it. Oh, the sun's going to move. I'm going to have to come over here and go bring the sun back down, go up to here, go up. Like, ugh. Wait a minute. Better features. Look, I can click on the sun. Wait, click on the sun and come over here and say, lock that sucker down. So now it's like the telescope. It's going to track the sun and we're just going to watch the sun and watch the moon come in, just like we're going to see in the scopes, except flipped. So everybody turn 
no, upside, no, that's not going to work. Okay, it's going to be flipped in the telescopes. Okay, I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Oh, there's the sun. Okay, so now let's get up to the right time frame. I'm going to go to, I'm going to back this down to 9 o'clock again, or back even farther. Okay, so there's just before 9, so let's get up to just before 2. So I went 12, there's just before 2. So what was it? 158, I think was the magic number, right? There's 158, one, whoa, see that? Oh, there's the moon. So run through some, some minutes here. Ooh, there's the moon. Now, look at the path of the moon. It's basically northwest, right? The way we're seeing it, northwest, remember that. You should really have pencil and paper writing these things down. So northwest for the moon. Okay, I'm gonna keep going. So this is only three o'clock now. Right, there's 3 o'clock. Okay, what's the magic number? 314. So 314, oh, 9, 10, 11, 12. Ooh, there we go. 313, 314. There's the thinnest sliver we're going to get. Looks reasonably dark. I like that. I'm hoping that we get it that dark. And if we back out, we've got the planets up there. So there's the planets all in a line. Now, they're all in a line. We'll see that later in the talk. The solar system is basically a flattish solar system. Tilted a little bit. All the planets have their own orbit tilts, but basically flat. That's why it's coming up in a line like that. Okay. So there's our closest we're going to get to totality. And then we keep moving. What's the end time? So 428-ish or so. So there's our 25, 26, 27. Boom. Moon's gone. But wait a minute. Watch the moon as it leaves. The moon's sort of going more northward. It's not as much northwest. What's going on? Oh, remember, they're both setting. So when they're up here in the sky, the moon goes sort of sideways. But now they're setting toward the horizon. The moon's going to go a little bit more vertical. Oh, that's why it's leaving. It comes in from the side, but then leaves a little bit more vertical. Because that's a two-hour, two-and-a-half-hour event. Okay, we only get the sliver, right? We're not in totality. We get 99% here. Toledo does. If only we could move to Toledo. Oh, wait a minute. We can so I can come over to here and say, search for Toledo. Oops, if I can spell it. Toledo, Toledo, Ohio. There we go. Go to the top of Tony Paco's. I have some hot dogs. and So use this location. Great, I'm in Toledo. Let's back this off a little bit. Oh, lucky pups. So they've got about two minutes. Right? If I go, if I just barely start there, there's 12, there's, uh, what's that, 312? So they get about two minutes worth because they're sort of on the edge of the path. We'll show you where they are on the path. But Burlington, hi Kelly. So Burlington's out there. Let's try Burlington. Burlington, BT. Just hopping around the globe, you know, as we astronomers do. Wait a minute. I was just at midpoint of eclipse. What happened? I got to go forward in time for Burlington? Why are they late? Oh, the shadow's moving across, right? Southwest up to northeast. The shadow's moving across the U.S. Well, they're farther east. The time's going to be, they're in the same time zone as us, but the time's going to be a little bit later. So I got to go farther in time. We're 314. They're 322. It's coming close. Oh, those pups, they get right in totality. They get about three and a half minutes. If we time that out, it's about three and a half minutes of totality. So, but they're looking at 4.30-ish because they're farther east from us. So it's a little bit, and they're also setting lower. They probably won't get Mars. Mars might be off the, you know, down below the horizon. Should be able to see Saturn over there still, if they can see the horizon. If Kelly goes to the top of the mountain, she should be able to see the horizon. So we can just hop around the globe to look at these eclipses. We can go back to 2017 and look at that too. But let's go on with our, how do we get these eclipses? Why is this happening? So the biggest unknown for us here is going to be what's called the Michigan Nebula, otherwise known as clouds. So are we going to get clouded out or rained out? That's the thing. April's a terrible month. August 17 was, I mean, the scheduling for Dr. Bujo was a little bit easier. I mean, I got us to 99%, but I can't, the weather, so... If there's clouds and rains, we're going to be here. We can live stream for places that don't have clouds. And so anybody that wants to come to campus, but you can live stream at home too. But if you want to come to campus, I'll do my color commentary. And so here's what the eclipse looks like. There's the path in the middle. That's the path of totality. So that's the darkest part of the shadow. 
If you're in the middle of that, you get the longest part. If you're up near the edge, you get a little bit shorter. This is a nice infographic. That's the term for this, where you get a bunch of information on there. You can see all the percentages. So there's all these lines that have the different percentages. So there's 100%. And then we get to 99 and 95 and 90 and 80 and 85 and so forth. So you can see that here's Michigan. There's the mitten. And so we get missed. The little corner of southeast Michigan, there's a little bit of a corner that's in totality. But then you can see it stripe up, and you can see Burlington right there. So, hi, Kelly. Okay, so she paid me a dollar every time I say hi, Kelly. So, um, But you can see the path, too, is cutting through a majority of where you've got a populated sort of part of the country. The other path, and we'll see a, a map of it, comes like this and cuts across like that. Well, you've got a lot of empty space out there. You've got people out there, but it's pretty far separated. So they say that there's way more people that are going to be near the path of totality or in totality this time than last time. We'll also see something about the path, too. Okay, so that's what the path looks like across the U.S. Here's where it misses us. Just in the lower corner, we've got just a little bit of Michigan right in there. But here's Toledo. Uh, where's Toledo? Bowling Green. Oh, there's Toledo right on the edge. But that little edge of Michigan there, oh, that's Ontario. Oh, yeah, we get this little tiny corner right there of Michigan. So if you want to crowd 1,000 people in that little tiny corner, you probably can't move. Here's the path going through, and we're missed, but we're out at about 99% or so, and then it goes drops off from there. Missed us by that much, as Maxwell Smart would say. So, better than the last time. We were like 85% last time. And you can see that upper northwest down to the southeast. Here's our path this time. Now, get some lucky people right there in the center of the country where they could be in the path twice. But if you think about it, that's going to be a pretty heavily populated area for people that did go to the first eclipse, and I think they had good weather then, are going to want to go for the second one. So there, there's all kinds of uh, police and ambulance and everybody that's worried about the path of totality because people are going to be crazy driving, stopping, trying to see. And so stay here in the 99 if you don't want to travel to that. So they're pretty lucky there. But this is much better than last time. Okay, here's a simulation on the left. This is what the 2024 one's going to look like. There's that black dot. That's the totality. That's the deepest part of the shadow. I'll show you what the shadows look like. There's the fuzzy stuff around it. We're in the fuzzy, right? We're 99% fuzzy, but we're not in the black dot. So anything in that fuzzy area that's coming up on the left here, that's going to be people that can see the eclipse. So South America gets skunked on this one. They get other eclipses. On the right... That's the 2017. That's actual pictures. Those are, that was a, a weather satellite that took pictures. There is the shadow that goes across. It goes upper northwest down to the southeast. So that's actual pictures of what the shadow looks like. And in the core of that would be that dot where the totality would be. A thousand miles per hour. That's how fast that eclipse shadow is going across. So we could do a quick calculation, Detroit to Burlington, to see how much of a time difference there should be for that eclipse. But it also gets a little faster like right there where now it's skimming off the edge of the Earth and it's going quicker across the surface, so it's complicated. Okay, how about eclipses in general? So we've got, it's a whole cosmic dance. The sun, the Earth, and the moon. Now, every time I say those three, three things in a row, my brain kicks into Wizard of Odd mode and I have to say, oh my, lions, tigers, and bears. So your job is to count how many oh my's I've got. So lunar eclipse, that's where the moon is gonna pass into our shadow. We have a shadow going out into space from the sun Moon passes into our shadow, that's a lunar eclipse. Solar is the other way around. The sun now casts a shadow from the moon on the earth. So it's the moon's shadow on the earth. That's the one we want. That's the one on the eighth. So when did these start? When did we start having these eclipses? Well, let's go way back to the beginning of the solar system. That's why it's a 24-hour marathon. Okay, maybe we don't have to go far, that far back. We need a moon to have the eclipses, right? So back around the beginning of the solar system, we got a moon. We had something about the size of Mars collided with us. The composition of the moon is basically the crust of the Earth, the, the outside edge of the Earth. So we think something banged into us and this blob went into orbit around us and then solidified, right? It cooled in orbit. It stuck in orbit with us, and it's also tidally locked. It only looks at us. There's a face of the moon. Does anybody see the man in the moon? I can never see. Oh, there's the eyes, and there's the... I never really see... So some people can see the moon, That's the man in the moon, that's great. But it always shows the same face. Every time we look at the moon, it's the same side of the moon that we see. 
a lot of the moons of other planets also do that. It's the moon orbit that determines whether we're going to have an eclipse and what kind of eclipse we're going to have. So how the moon orbits us. So how about the ancient humans that were looking up and trying to figure out what's going on in the heavens? Some of this would have been a little bit confusing. The sun, eh, it's every day, rises over there and it sets over there. Sometimes it's a little bit higher, sometimes a little bit lower, but that goes with the seasons. That would be a regular pattern. This is regular enough that nobody would be too confused about it. The moon sometimes has weird shapes. So those are the phases. We'll get to that. Maybe moon fairies, they'd invent the moon fairy terms. So that was a rolling of the eyes if you couldn't see that. So, But a little bit of a worry, what's happening to the moon? But again, that's regular. That's every month you'd go through these series of phases. So it's not too unusual. But if something's eating the sun, yeah, that's a problem. Now, remember this. These are the ancient humans looking at this. If they happen to see a total solar eclipse and they saw the sun disappear, A, that would freak them out. But B, it would never happen again in their lifetime. Probably. And I'll show you a number for that. So this would be, they'd check with all the elders in the group. Hey, anybody see this before? Nope. That would be weird. But it doesn't repeat for them. That's the weird part about it. So this would freak them out. Okay, fun fact. I threw these in so you don't get bored and fall asleep. There's cycles of, you know, our timekeeping go with some of the astronomical cycles. So the year, Earth goes around the sun. We have the seasons, all four seasons through one year. The sun rises high in the summertime, low in the wintertime, and so forth. The moon is basically, the moon orbit around us is basically a month until we have these rulers that step in and say, oh, I want a month, and I want a month too, and... So if you look at December, that's DEC, that's decimal, that's 10. Why is it the 12th month? Wait a minute, October, oct is 8. Why is that the 10th month? Well, they shoved in January and February, so that pushed those down. And, oh, they put in, they renamed July and August, Julius and Augustus. Oh, I want more days, so I get 31 days because I'm important. So you get these rulers messing around on the calendar. Hey, it's astronomy. You don't mess around with astronomy. Oh, look at this. The week is seven. Five naked eye planets, sun and the moon. There's our week. Okay, that's one thing you can check off. You don't have to remember that anymore. Okay, early models. We said whatever we see out there is basically the universe. Hey, we're the center. Woohoo! Very egocentric, or should I say geocentric? Huh? Earth, geo? Now, now you know what it's like to be in my astronomy class three days a week you get the joy of these astronomy puns. So you'll feel a little bit of that during this session. This is not a terrible model. And so I've got a chemistry uh, colleague that used to say, all models are wrong, some models are useful. They're not perfect, but some are useful. It's not a terrible model. All that stuff goes across the sky from our perspective. We're not moving. The Greeks didn't think we were moving. It doesn't feel like we're moving but we're rotating around the axis of the Earth. At the equator, it's 1,000 miles an hour. Here, it's only 700. At the North Pole, South Pole, it's zero. You don't feel like you're moving, though, but hang on, because not only are we spinning on our axis, we're orbiting the sun. The solar system's moving in the galaxy. The galaxy's on a collision course with Andromeda. Okay, not for a couple of years. A, a couple of billion years. We're good for Andromeda. But we got all kinds of motion going on. And one of my phrases in my astronomy class, nothing's not, nothing's not moving. I know it's a double negative. I don't care. I like the nothing's not moving. I wish I could get a nothing's not, I want an N on the end there. But nothing's not moving. That's one of my phrases. The other phrase is march of technology. I mean, we can, astronomy is a perfect class to illustrate the march of technology. What could we see with a crude telescope? What did we see before the telescopes? What do we see before the telescopes? Five naked eye planets, sun and the moon, that's it, and stars. But after the telescope, oh, we've got moons around those things up there. Oh, we, oh, earth-centered, not sun, I mean, sun-centered, not earth-centered. So we invented these celestial spheres. We said, okay, give the moon a sphere around us, because everything's going around us. Sun gets a sphere. Planets get a sphere. You get a sphere. You get a sphere. Whoa, sorry, audio people. You get a sphere. Everybody gets a sphere. Well, with the sun and the moon, we're sort of half right. The moon orbits us. This, we orbit the sun, though. Everybody else orbits the sun. So moon orbits us 25 and a half solar days, so sun, or 24-hour days. 
That's the phases, full moon, full phase to full phase, new phase to full. What are these phases? Okay. Moon is lit up by the sun, doesn't have its own light. It's reflecting the light from the sun. Sometimes we see the moon fully lit up, full moon. Sometimes only part of the moon's lit up to us, from our perspective, looking at the, earth, the moon. Because where it is in its orbit, we're going to see that illustrated. 50% of the moon's surface is always lit up, right? 50% of the Earth's surface is always lit up. We're heading into night right now, but there's a day side over there. Half the Earth is in day, half the Earth's in night. Regardless of the time frame, it's not 12 hour, 12 hour night in your location, half the Earth is lit up, half the moon is lit up. But it's how much of the moon's lit up surface can we see, that gives us the phases. So because they're orbiting us, the moon is orbiting us, it's somewhere off to the side most of the time. It can't be in the shadow. So the phases aren't really connected to the shadow. Now you're going to say lunar eclipses. Oh, just calm down. We're not there yet. Settle down. Okay, let's illustrate. We like to look down onto the solar system from above. That's how we orient ourselves. There's the Earth in the middle. It's rotating counterclockwise. The moon going around it. Oh, I forgot. I, I always forget I have a pointer. So there's the Earth rotating counterclockwise. There's the moon in different spots going around counterclockwise. The Earth is going around the sun counterclockwise. Now, for the younger people in the audience, if you go out to a museum and you go to the timepieces, the measuring of time section of the museum, they have these things with these arms that point to different numbers. And that's how people would tell time in the past. And those arms always move the same direction, the clockwise. That's how we say clockwise. Okay. So here's the sun. It's lighting up half the moon. All those moon locations are all half lit up, right? The Earth's half lit up. But it's what we see when we look up toward the moon. We're looking along these red lines. We only see the half of the moon that's on our side, right? If I start here with new moon, well, I don't see the moon. The other side's lit up. I don't see anything lit up on my side. So we're going to start our cycle there. So there's our new moon cycle. We come over a little bit. The moon orbits around us. So the moon moves in its orbit. Well, now we see a little sliver of that moon, that crescent, right? So we call that a crescent phase. We named it crescent phase for astronomy before the rolls got to it. So just to keep that clear. We go halfway. Now we're half lit up. It's exactly perpendicular. It's 90 degrees from the sun. That can't be the moon, the Earth's shadow. Right? Where's the Earth's shadow? It's out over here to the left. That's not in the Earth's shadow. It's not the shadow of the Earth halfway covering the moon. That's the moon is half lit up that we can see. Now, we can talk about first quarter as, well, if you look down from the top, it's really a quarter of that whole moon that we see lit up. It's also the first quarter of the circle. So either way, there's a first quarter over there. Come around to full. Oh, wait, so in between full and new, I mean full and first quarter, there's more than half, less than one. That term is gibbous. Now, look at that side. There's a waxing side there. We start from new. We get up to full. That's waxing. So if you think of the Karate Kid movie, wax on, wax off. That's for the gray hairs in the audience. So wax on, you're turning the moon on to bright. OK. On the other side here, we have waning, right? It's now bright. It's going to wane down to new. Waning would be, if I have too many slides and too many puns, your interest in the talk wanes. It drops off, right? Okay. So we get to the gibbous up there. We get to full over here. That's really second quarter, technically. We're seeing half of the moon lit up. We're seeing all of what we see lit up, but it's half the moon is lit up because it's always half lit up. Then we come down. We've got our waning over here, our gibbous. Then we got third quarter, because if that's second quarter, this would be third quarter, right? We're th three quarters of the way around the loop. Then we get our waning crescent and so forth, go up and around. So if you notice, other than new and full, the Earth's shadow is not in there. And for new, the Earth's shadow is not there. Where's the Earth's shadow? Out here. So the full moon might get into the Earth's shadow, but everything else in there is where the moon is in the sky, how much of it we see lit up, has nothing to do with the shadow. So we don't care about it because it's not an eclipse thing. We care about the eclipses. I want new for solar. I want full for lunar. So new is the one we really care about. Here's the lunar eclipses. Not to scale. Just make sure. OK, because that would be bad. There's the sun. Here's the Earth. There's the shadow going out. Now, there's really two shadows. We've got a penumbra, like penultimate. It's next to not quite the ultimate. And so that if I'm, if I'm down here, 
if the moon is over here, I can still see part of the sun. Well, if I can see part of the sun, I'm not in a deep shadow. But if I get in behind the earth, I'm in a deep shadow. So you might think, okay, well, in your deep shadow, maybe I don't see the moon at all. It completely blanks out. Here's the thing. Luckily, we've got an atmosphere around the earth. See this blue glow? So look, thank goodness we have an atmosphere. Well, the atmosphere, the light from the sun, if we didn't have an atmosphere, you'd have a completely dark moon if it got into that full shadow. But because we have an atmosphere, the light bends around. Now, this is basically sunrise and sunset sides. So what's the sunrise and sunset light? Sort of reddish. Because the blue light's scattering and the red stuff comes through. So that's red light that bends around the earth, gets the moon, reflects back. So if you can get the moon into the deep shadow, then it goes red. Those are interesting. Total lunar eclipses would be interesting. If the moon is sitting out here, not so interesting. Okay, who gets to see a lunar eclipse? Here's the one benefit for lunar eclipses. Basically, anybody there, right? Anybody on that side of the earth. So you have to be on the correct side of the earth to see the lunar eclipse. Solar eclipses, we missed by this much. We're not going to see the solar total, but lunar eclipse, everybody gets to see, at least on that half of the earth. Okay, how about solar eclipses? Sun, now the moon, new moon phase, right? We're looking at the back. The, now, could this be Pink Floyd's dark side of the moon? Maybe. There's the Earth. How much of the Earth can see a part of a solar eclipse? Well, that's going to be that big sort of oval, the fuzzy, right? The fuzzy we saw from the animation. So we're in that fuzzy, 99%. 99% fuzzy. So if you take nothing away from this talk, we're 99% fuzzy on April 8th. If you can get into the deep part of that shadow, there, they can see the total, so, total solar eclipse. They're in where the moon is completely blocking, is completely covering the sun. How does this work? Well, the sun is way bigger than the moon, 400 times bigger. Oh, but it's 400 times farther away. So we can get the moon and the sun to line up. If it's the right conditions, they can line up and cover each other. The moon can cover the sun. Now, this was sun, earth, moon. So Earth's in the middle. This was Sun, Moon, Earth. Moon's in the middle. What if we put the Sun... So that was lunar eclipse, then solar eclipse. What if we put the Sun in between the Earth and the Moon? Well, that's an apocalypse. So thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Don't you feel for my astronomy students in the back there? Okay. So we did that. We did that. Okay. So now let's define our solar system references. We're doing the referencing, right? We figured out we're going around the Sun. That's fine. We're switching over to heliocentric. Helios, Greek for sun. Fun fact, helium we discovered in the sun before we discovered it here on Earth. So that particular element we called helium because helios. Okay, we orbit the sun. We've got a nice flat plane in space. So that's going to be our reference plane. Everybody else, we refer to that plane. So all the other planets, so Martians, screw you. We're doing the calling here. We're doing the measuring. So it's our plane that we care about. Moon has a slight tilt to its orbit plane, so it's tilted relative to us. Ah, so it moves on its tilted orbit path. Sometimes it cuts below our plane, meaning between us and the sun. Sometimes it rises above. So we've got to be in the right phase. We want new moon for solar eclipse. We want full moon for lunar. But we've also got to be cutting above and below. We might not be, we might be way above or way below. In the right phase, but in the wrong spot relative to the sun-moon line or sun-earth line. So, here's the picture. Everybody's going counterclockwise. The moon's going counterclockwise around us. We're going counterclockwise around the sun. If you look on the two sides, here's a situation where new moon phase, great, solar eclipse. Oh, the shadow's passing below the earth. It's in the wrong spot vertically. Full moon phase, lunar. No, it's too high. It's not, it's outside the shadow. And over there, we flip them. New moon is too low. Now the new moon's too high. Full moon's too low. But the bottom and the top, they're in the right position. This one is crossing. It's coming up from below. Remember, counterclockwise around. It's coming up, and it's a new moon. Great. There's a solar eclipse. If it came around here and is dropping down below our plane, and it's a full moon, great. Lunar eclipse. It's right in the shadow. If it's not quite in the shadow, then you get that penumbral. If it's not quite along the line, you get the partial solar eclipse and so forth. But if you're right bang on, there's the totality. There's that dark red moon. Other side also. We're cutting now. This is a descending. This is a falling down below the plane or rising above the plane. So those are the ones we want. And this is the one we get on April 8th. 
That's the one where it's rising above and we get a new moon phase so we can get to cover up the sun. But so we've got to be in the right place at the right time. Take a break. We talk about hot dogs and hot dog buns. So do we have the vendors that I can't remember if we, oh, I get, I, we forgot to order the vendors. Okay, sorry. So I go to the store, I buy 10 hot dogs. Ugh, I buy eight buns. What the, what the frick is that? Why are they, that's not fair. So I go 10 dogs and eight buns, I've got two extra hot dogs. Now I gotta buy a packet of buns. Well, now I got six extra buns. Now I gotta buy another packet of hot dogs. Back and forth, back and forth. Wait a minute, wait a minute, eight. I see eight extra dogs. I can buy eight buns, boom, done. Once I bought four packages of hot dogs, that's 40 hot dogs. Five packages of buns, that's five, that's 40 buns, perfect, it lines up. Now the math people here would say, oh, 40 is the least common multiple. I can take 10, multiply by something and get 40. I can take eight, multiply by something and get 40. That's the first time it happens after 10 and eight. Now 80 would work, 120 would work, but that's not the least. That's the least common multiple. So I need four of one thing and five of another thing. That's the key. So if I've got some sort of cycle like this, I need so many of these cycles and so many of these cycles, I line up again. Oh, line up, line up. That's what we want. We want the line up in space. Okay, so if we're passing through the Earth-Sun plane, great, that's one of the cycles we have to worry about. If we're in the new phase or the full phase, great, we can get an eclipse. We want new and we want to pass through the plane. So there's two things. So hot dogs and buns. There's our hot dogs and buns, I think. So here's the phases cycle, full moon to full moon, new moon to new moon, 29 and a half days. But it might not be passing the plane. So we gotta look at the other cycle, 27.2. Why can't they line up? I mean, if they just had those two numbers the same, it'd be much better. This is passing the plane, but it might not be in the right phase. There's a problem. We got hot dogs and buns, there's a third phase that we gotta worry about. Close and far distance of the moon, it's in an elliptical orbit. It's sometimes closer to us, sometimes farther. We gotta get it to line up over the sun. If it's too far away, it looks smaller, and thus we get this ring of the sun all the way around, thick ring, no totality. That's called an annular eclipse, not annual every year, annular. I got another, there's a third number, and that's not the same as the other two. If I design the next solar system, we're getting lunar, solar, lunar, solar. I want, I want regularity here. I want all these numbers to be the same. So we look for that least common multiple. It's going to be the Saros number. Here's this number, roughly 6,500 days or so, 18 years for now. We'll talk about it like that. We get similar eclipse conditions. 2017, that wasn't 18 years ago. Hold on, just settle down. We'll get there. If we take into account all three, so, oh, we have to add, we got hot dogs, we got buns, add pickles, oh my. So now we have three cycles, you're counting. Uh, synodic, draconian, anomalous, oh, did I show you those? Yeah, sorry, so that's the synodic is the phase period. The draconic cycle, that's the rising above or below. And then there's anomalistic, that's the one where it's close far sort of thing. So we gotta get all three of those, oh my, everybody all together, oh my, okay. The Soros cycle is the least common multiple. We put all those three together, we get to the Soros cycle. So we do some math on this. If I take my fancy, here's my actual 29.53, whatever, divide that into that, the full Soros number, we get basically 22, 223 days. 242, 239. Ah, those are the how many hot dogs do you need? How many buns do you need? How many pickles do you need? Line those all up. Oh my, we get to our similar eclipse. Now we're in a particular series of these sorrow cycles. So we're in series number 139. This is an ascending node. This is rising above the plane. 2017, clearly not 18 years ago, was in an ascending node, but it's a different cycle series. So that's 145. So we decided, we put together this whole list of these cycles, these similar 18 years apart, 18 years apart, and we went back to about 2000 BCE and said, let's start there, let's call that series one, and then run everybody forward. And then, so there's overlapping series, we can see that there's 145 is overlapping with us, 139. So they're off by, what, nine years? Eight, how many years? 
17 to 24, seven years. So we're off by seven years, not 11 years. Our particular cycle started in 1500s. We're going to go to 2763. The longest event, seven minutes of totality, that's 2186. So mark your calendars. Now, if you're keeping track, that's the first time I used that particular joke, but you got to count that one too. Okay, fun fact, here's a little interlude. When you've got a total solar eclipse, you often have a lunar eclipse on one side or the other. And you can, if you think about it over here, let's say I've got a total solar eclipse here. We might be able to have before, two weeks earlier or so, maybe that moon was passing into the shadow and the Earth hasn't moved enough so that I can come around, bang, I can get a nice solar eclipse going there. So two weeks before, oh, earlier this week, March 25th, we had a penumbral lunar eclipse. Now, I didn't call you all to come to the campus because A, it's three o'clock in the morning, and B, remember what I said about penumbral? This has been described as one of the most boring types of eclipses because you barely shade the moon dark. It's not red, forget red. You're barely nudging, you're not even, you're not even out, that's the full, that's light from the sun reflecting. You're barely in that outer shadow. So, boring eclipse. Here's our partial solar, two weeks later, nothing. Oh, because now the Earth's moved too far around. Now we're in these conditions where it doesn't match. The, sun's too, the moon is too low for the shadow to hit us and so forth. Okay. So let's look at these 18, day, 18, 18 years. 18 years, 11 days, 8 hours. That's what our next cycle would be. So here's the one for the 8th. Here we go up to, so let's see, 24 to 42. That checks out for 18. April, still April because it's only 11 days. 11 plus 8, that's only 19. This shows 20. Oh, but here's universal time. So that's up to 18. That's like 6 p.m. universal. So if I add 8 hours to that, I go, oh, oh, 2. There's the 6 hours to get to midnight and then 2 beyond. So that checks. That number looks pretty good. Here's the next one. Great. So 2042. All these kinds of calculations, there's a guy named Fred Espinac. He's known as Mr. Eclipse. He's got 6,000 years of eclipse calculations, lunar, solar. He's got an amazing catalog out there. So earned the title, Mr. Eclipse. Okay, well, let's look at 2042. Mark your calendars. There, somebody check that off the list. Ah, uh, wait a minute. It's over in the Philippines. We don't get to see that one. That's, a, that's 18 years from us. What the heck? We're missing another cycle. The Earth rotation. The Earth rotating, and we're not rotated into view for that particular eclipse. It's only happening for a certain number of hours. Well, our rotation cycle is different. <sighs> now we got to add mustard. So we got hot dogs, buns, pickles, mustard. There isn't anybody in the audience that puts ketchup on hot dogs, is there? Ketchup on hot Okay, security. I'm going to have some people you have to escort from the auditorium. Ketchup on hot dogs. Okay, the pesky Earth rotation, that's going to throw us off in terms of us being able to see it. Okay. Here's the 17th, 2017. So if we go 18 years from that, there's our 2035. Oh, 2035, that's only 11 years from now. Maybe that's, we got a possibility? No. Stupid Earth rotation. Again, next solar system I design, things are going to be regular. I want on the clock. I want... Freaking eclipses, so, so many eclipses, we're bored with them. This wait seven years to get to another eclipse. Okay, let's look at the two paths. Here's the 2017, here's the 2024. Wow, 2024 is much wider. In fact, it's twice as wide as the other path. So A, that helps with how many people are going to see this eclipse. Why the heck is it wider? Oh, moon's closer. We're a little closer to the sun. The moon's a little closer to us. It still lines up to get to totality, but now we've got a bigger path on the earth. Remember, everything's going left to right as we go across, right? It started Pacific Northwest, went to Southeast. This is coming up from Mexico and coming across our Northwest, Northeast. So everything goes left to right because the moon is orbiting and crossing. Remember our original picture of the LTU campus? The moon is crossing that way, so the shadow goes from the west to the east. Well, let's see some other ones. So for the young people in the audience, this is way back in the 1900s. So all of the ones in the 20th century, all the ones in the 1900s. So 1925, that's a good 
swath through New York City. So that predates my mom in New York City, but her parents could have seen that eclipse. That would have gone right through New York City. That also went through upper part of Michigan and then over into the UP. So 1925 predates you, sir, I think. Right? Okay, so that can't be the one you were thinking of. But there is a 32, let's see, you were talking in the 50s, 54. That goes a little far off to the Midwest. But it might have been a partial eclipse and not a total eclipse, but we can talk later. Okay, so we get different wide paths. Look at 79. That was a nice super wide path. That was the Earth, the moon was pretty close, and we were pretty close to the sun. Look at 1930. That's really narrow. In fact, I think there was a guy named Roger in Nevada. He saw the eclipse, but that's a really super thin path. That was, what a ripoff eclipse that is. You spend, spend all this money on the eclipses, you think we'd get a wider path out of it. Okay, remember the thing about the ancients looking up and saying, freaking out because they saw a total solar eclipse. Oh, wait, I'm not there yet, sorry. Okay, next in Michigan, 2099. We're gonna cut right through Western Michigan. So we don't have to travel far. We're gonna miss Detroit, I think, but we're gonna get at least into really close to Detroit. That would be sort of lean to the west and you might be able to see it. So mark your calendars. Okay, how about 2099? That's good, that cuts right through. So let's see, if I hop in a rocket and make use of Einstein's relativity, I might be able to make it to 2099. So cross fingers, because that's how relativity works. Okay, here's the thing. If you want to be in the same spot and see a total eclipse twice in the same spot, where you're basically on average, you got to wait like 400 years. Now this is hot dogs, buns, pickles, mustard. All those line up, it's like every 400 years. So think of this ancient tribe. Oh, we're freaking out. The sun is gone. Never again in their lifetime. Never again in anyone in their tribe's lifespan would that have happened again. So that would have been a freaky occurrence. We look at it now and go, let's all go to the quad and watch. And they're all hovering somewhere going, what the heck's going on with the sun? And why are the animals all looking at their wristwatches? You know. So every 400 years or so. So there's some places here get skunked. Some of the parts of Canada up there get skunked, in, at least in this thousand year period here. Some parts of the US. There's a spot right in here that's really close to where you got that double. You got the 2017 and 2024, but looks like they're getting skunked for this whole thousand year path. Now, it's possible 2024 overlapped that because this only goes up to 2017. So let's look forward to the future. What do we have going for us? Not a whole lot after this eclipse. This is going to be the, better, the best one we've got coming. We've got some partial solars, but that's total solar somewhere on the Earth. Oh, wait, that's the one. That's ours. Right. Okay, that's good. Um, but here's a partial lunar. Here's a total lunar eclipse. That's pretty good. Thursday to Friday, March. That's 2025, so next year, March. Now that's uh, 13th to the 14th, that might be our spring break, but that's a Thursday, Friday. So if it's not our spring break, it's gonna be tough to stay up till from midnight to six to watch that. Tuesday, March 3rd, 2026, that's probably before our spring break. That's again, a three to seven in the morning. Some of these are really tough to schedule on reasonable hours, so. Here's a partial solar. Now this is terrible. This is basically the reverse of what we're gonna see in April because this is, here's the moon at maximum coverage of the sun is that little sliver. We're flipping it. We're saying, no, no, cover all of it except that little sliver of the sun. So yeah, it's a partial solar eclipse, but not a great one. This is all Detroit, and this is time of date again. So then we got some penumbrals. What do we say about penumbrals? Most boring eclipse ever invented. So it's not looking good the next couple of years. So hopefully we get good weather on the 8th because that's what we really want or you're going to totality and getting good weather. So again, it's circumstances on the campus here. We're gonna have the filtered telescopes. We're gonna have the projections so you can take a selfie. I know, I know all you people out here love your selfies with the eclipses. Pinhole projectors, simple. Cereal boxes, long cardboard tubes. Solar glasses free, but not unlimited. So we, once they're gone, they're gone, but we got plenty, we got a boatload. Should be set up by 1.30. I'll be starting to set up at six o'clock in the morning probably because I'm nervous. Stay till about 4.30. Now, if we get clouds and rain and stuff, we're gonna come in here, we're gonna watch live streams and so forth. 
Here's some live streams. I'm going to have all these links. I'm hoping to put them out on the Eclipse site. I'll show you the Eclipse link in a second. It's easy, ltu.edu slash Eclipse. So I'm going to try and put all these links out there. I'll leave you with Pink Floyd's lyrics. And that's a QR code. For those of you that understand a QR code, there, you could take that picture. If you don't, don't worry about it. But there's a nice simple link to remember. That'll link you over to the other page, and I hope to have the other links there. The talk is on the YouTube link, is on that particular link. Uh, and I'll try and put some of these other links that I've referenced on there. So, happy to take any questions. So, Dr. Bujo, right. I think is... I'm, I'm oh, right, I'm there we right go. here. Okay. So, I know now what, uh, what Dr. Scott was doing for the past seven years. He was buying, frantically buying hot dogs and buns and ketchup and mustard. It, I had to do the experiment. I mean, I am a scientist, so... So a go. lot of no ketchup. I, ju I just heard ketchup. Security. Yes. Dr. Scott. Yes. You alluded to, you stated that these people freaked out because it, at what point in history did somebody put the information together so that thousands and thousands and thousands of years later you could stand here and go backwards when in history did somebody piece together that this was not going to end the earth? Right, right. There's good news and bad news. Pretty early on, I mean, the ancient Greeks had figured out a lot of stuff here. They had started working on, hey, you know, we've got this seasons are shifting, and so we've got to do something about the leap years and so forth. And that was pretty far back. And you get up into, once you got to Newton, Newton invents calculus to be able to do some of the stuff he wants to do. So all you people taking calculus, uh, think about trying to invent it and then use it. Rather, you just have to use it, you know. So once we get up to the calculus age, okay, then we can do a lot of these very careful calculations. So that's the good news. The bad news is we've got to get that information out to the public because Halley's Comet comes around every 78 years. Halley's Comet came around 1900s or so and then 85, I think it was. The frustrating thing for me is 85, I was like an adult-ish, grad school, I should have been able to say, oh, I remember we're looking at Halley's Comet. I have no memory of Halley's Comet in 85. I'm not going to make it 78 years for the next, <laughs> the next time. So for some reason, I blanked out seeing Halley's Comet. But anyways, Halley's Comet comes around early 1900s or so. People were selling to the public, not online. We didn't have online yet. So all you kids, there was a time before online. It's amazing. But people were selling comet pills to protect you from the effects of the comet that was going to be in our skies. That's 1900s. I mean, I, we're not the height of intellectual stimulation there, but it's the 1900s. It's not way back in the caveman, cave people days where what the heck is happening to the sun. So we pretty well, eased, pretty, pretty, I mean, amazingly figured out pretty quickly the seasons and the timing of things. And I'm really amazed at how, how carefully they time things out. So to get to the leap day stuff, you've got to have a very careful measurement of the time it takes the Earth to go around the sun to figure out, oh, yeah, we're a quarter of a day off. And we can do leap days only up to a certain point, And then you've got to do, oh, centuries. I need a century rule. Oh, wait, I need a four-century rule, a 400-year rule. So we got to that relatively quickly. But I'm talking way back before we had some of that more enlightenment. So we did get to it relatively quickly, and yet we also sold comet pills in the 1900s. So uh, that's depressing. But nowadays, there's no selling of anything fake that wouldn't be a reasonable thing, right? So luckily, we've gone past those days. So that's the good news, bad news. Other questions? I should specify, because I've got some relatives in the audience, questions related to astronomy. No personal Dr. Scott history. No, no, up there. Oh, OK. Why did you choose to do Eclipse by Pink Floyd instead of the one that everybody was streaming in 2017, Dark Side of the Moon by Bonnie Tyler? Yeah, Bonnie Tyler, and I, I thought to put the image up. So um, what's the Eclipse? Eclipse of the heart, right? Total eclipse of the heart. 
So Bonnie Tyler, that timing of that song is pretty close to the totality timing for this particular eclipse for most of the places. So if you start playing Bonnie Tyler at the beginning of the eclipse, it runs the duration of the totality. So it happens to work out. I don't think she planned it for this. She could have because the, we could have done the calculations back when she sang the song, but I don't really think that's what happened. I'm a Pink Floyd person more than a Bonnie Tyler. Okay, brace yourself for this question. <laughs> Okay, I understand how important it is to not yeah. look at the sun as a human being. Right. But is it also that important to bring Jack the dog in from outside so he doesn't... Yeah, so I don't know that animals him. look up at the sun. I think they're sort of smarter than us in some ways. So I, you know, I don't think we, see, we catch animals staring at the sun. So I think they're good. Um, there's nothing about near totality. That's like There's not like extra radiation or something. But I don't think animals look at the sun normally, so I, I wouldn't worry. If you want to bring animals in, that's fine. But don't go out and try and protect deer in the wilderness and stuff. I mean, don't worry about that. They're fine. But if you want to bring in a personal pet, that's fine. If you're anywhere near totality and it's crazy, noisy, and I mean, it'd be like fireworks. Bring them inside for that. But I don't think that's a, a worry. So it's an interesting, I mean, it's an interesting idea, but I, don't, I, I think they're smarter than us in that respect. Um, so uh, you mentioned that the moon is the sun is 400 times uh, bigger than the moon. Right. But it's 400 times like uh, farther away. Farther away. Right. Yep. So we're just lucky, like in the yes. universe. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Good point. So we have eclipses. We can have that total eclipse. We can have the moon just barely, exactly cover. Moon can be farther away from us, but when it's close to us and we're close to the sun, we can get the moon to just barely cover. And we've got a good run of time when we can do that. If we're farther away from the sun, I mean, if we're closer to the sun and then the moon is farther from us, well, now the sun's too big and we can't cover it. Well, the moon's moving away from us and it has to do with the tides. It's its own fault. The moon's own fault that it's moving away from us because what it does is it raises the tides, right? It's got a gravitational pull that pulls the water a little bit, the water from the oceans and so forth. Well, the earth is also spinning. The moon's going around, it's pulling up those oceans, but we spin, so we move that water sort of blob forward a little bit. So the moon looks at it and says, oh wait, I've got a little bit more mass forward, let me speed up a little bit. Well, things in orbit, and Kepler worked this out in the 1600s, things in orbit, if they're speeding up, they're gonna move farther out. So the moon is slowly moving away from us. Now, it's only about an inch per century, so no cause for alarm. And if you think about it, the farther away it goes, less effect on the tides, less amount of that water pulling forward, less pulling it forward. So it's moving an inch per century fast now, but that's going to slow down. We've got a good five, what was the number? Five million years? 500. 500. Around 600 million. 500,000 years. No, 500 million, 500 million years. We got 500 million years to go before we say, guess what? You don't get a total solar eclipse anymore. You're only going to get annular eclipses. Now, 500 million years sounds like a long time, but that's not what we have to worry about. Five billion years, that's when that sun that we love so much in the summertime, that's going to blow up on us, and that's a problem. But that's, so mark your calendars. <laughs> that's an extra one. Now, so I did a count. How many omis did I have? I think there were four. I may not have said one, though. Okay, how many mark your calendars? No, no. I think that was five. I think that was an added, unadded one. I got four, but I just added that one. So five billion years, that's when the sun's going to blow up a bit. But we've got a good 500 million years of eclipses. So don't worry. You'll get every 400 years or so, you'll get to more eclipses. Uh, wait, i got to do the math on that. Other questions? Well, it seems like this is a good uh, stopping point. So let's uh, thank Dr. Scott one, one more time. So I skipped over some slides when you weren't looking. There, we got to the final count for the slides. So there's my email if you want to ask questions over email too. I'm going to stay up here too if you want to uh, ask questions up here. Um, and then that's the QR code. That's the link up there. So I'm going to try and put these, some of these links out there. The talk, the, the YouTube talk is out there. This, what we just did. Uh, and then I'll try and put some of the links from the talk out there, too, if you want to see those. So if you can get in totality, do get into totality. If you want to come here for 99%, please, we welcome you here. 
and everybody cross your fingers because that's how weather works. Cross your fingers for good weather on the 8th. Okay, take care. I'll be here for questions if you have questions.